Verse 11, chapter 22 in Genesis. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. And the reason that he called it Jehovah Jireh was because the Lord provided a lamb to be offered up in the stead of uh, Abraham offering up his son. I just want to talk to you in brief uh, this afternoon from the theme, The Lord Will Provide. Yes, yes he will. The Lord will provide. Uh, there, there are so many different sermons and stories uh, that can be gleaned from this one chapter of uh, the 22nd uh, chapter, shall I say, of Genesis. Uh, because the whole ordeal, if you want to use it as Old Testament prophecy, even of the messianic sort, uh, where God told Abraham to go and to offer up his son, uh, there are many who argue to this day that the same place where Abraham tied Isaac to the altar uh, was the same place where Jesus would later be crucified. Uh, the fact that the ordeal from the time when the Lord told him uh, to offer your son and when they left home going to the designated place for the offering and by the time he got back home, it had been three days and nights. So even in the length of time when the son was really set free from the penalty of death, it pointed to the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you come to the point that when God... Uh, rescued Isaac it was because there was a ram caught by his head in the thicket it is said that that thicket represented our Lord's crown of thorns and that he died uh, Jesus did the ram rather died in the place of Isaac and Jesus died in our place and to emphasize that point uh, when he came before Pilate Pilate set forth two one Jesus and the other Barabbas and actually that name Barabbas is Bar Abbas which is really saying son of a man so Barabbas was released and Jesus was crucified. So Jesus died in the place of Barabbas. And I am a son of a man. So he died in my place. There are so many stories here. 
that parallel the life, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I want to deal with the fact that the Lord provided Jehovah Jireh. And he is today Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. And he provides all things that are needful to his people. By providing, I see a threefold uh, provision here. First of all, he made available something in the physical which was necessary. Secondly, he also made it possible for Abraham to fulfill a spiritual imperative. And thirdly, God, through sparing the life of Isaac, reestablished the prophetic link to Abraham's future. Let, let's just look at this. He made available something needful in the physical. Abraham left home with the distinct obligation and intention of offering up to God something that was physical and tangible. I, I, you may as well get this in your mind that when you come to the Lord, when you succumb to all of the teachings of the critic, that all the Lord wants is your heart. And here you are boasting about your raises and boasting about the new position, boasting about how much money you have been blessed with, boasting about the fact that now all of my bills are paid, I'm debt free, and my bottom line is constantly going up, and then go to church and get upset whenever something is stated about bringing to the Lord a physical offering. I want you to know that there is a spiritual problem going on inside of you. We live in a physical world. No two ways about it. I know that we emphasize, and we especially emphasize it at a time like during a funeral. Uh, it helps to dry up the tears. It helps us to look on the bright side when we can say that in that casket where there is a physical structure, a physical body, that that is not the real person, that that person, the real person, is the spirit being. But see, when the spirit being is totally the only existent one, it's because that body can no longer move around on this earth. As long as you can walk and talk and eat, you are in the physical. And your way of showing your love for God has to be in the physical. Don't talk about, you know, well, you see, uh, my spirit uh, was there, but I didn't make it. No, so every once in a while, you need to uh, wrap your spirit up in some clothes and bring your spirit to church. <laughs> because you live in a physical in a material universe and as long as you are in this physical this material universe physical things are going to have to be done if you can't say man just say ouch it'll be all right that's why uh, two sundays ago uh, when we dealt with the scripture on name it and claim it that's why some of you had on your prayer request that you got to have a decent car because God gave you a job. 
but you can't lie there in your bed and by osmosis send your spirit to fulfill your obligation at your place of employment. Your body has got to take your spirit to that place where you can put in an honest day's work. So because you live in the material universe, you, you got to have somewhere to lay your head. You got to have food to keep the body operative. You got to have an automobile to get you from one place to another. And truth of the matter is, uh, those of you who uh, have found love in your life, and uh, certainly uh, I believe that when you find love in your life, it ought to be between a male and a female. Because God made it where the male and the female in the act of marital love can create another life. You can get married and love all you want to and never touch each other and there is no fruit of that love. Hello. You are in the physical and everything that you do has some kind of a physical release. God provided Abraham with what he needed in the physical. He had to go and make an offering. Why was that important? Because it was clearly pronounced even before Moses came to write the law that when one came into the presence of God, he could not come before God empty. Come before the Lord and do what? Bring an offering. And the first two uh, sons that we read about born to Adam and Eve God judged the kind of men they were by the offering that they brought Abel brought an offering that had blood in it a costly offering his brother Cain who was a tiller of the soil he just went and gathered up some vegetation, probably mixed with weeds, and said, here, you God, take this. And God didn't receive Cain and didn't receive his offering. And I say even now that Cain must have been the father of drug abusers. Preacher, where you get that from? Because when you go back and read creation story, all of the herbs, the fruit of the ground, when God made it, he said, it's good. But for Cain, who was dealing with the fruit of the ground, to end up getting a hold of something that made him crazy enough to kill his own brother, he must have taken God's good herbs and abused that which God said is good. See, God may tell you something is good, but it's good when it's used right. When you abuse it, you mess up. So God has established, when you come into my presence, don't come empty, bring an offering. And the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, offer to me, your son, your only son. Now, now here's something that I want to establish and reestablish. God never has, he does not now, nor will he ever demand that any human being offer another human being up as a sacrifice. He told Abraham to offer your son. But although he offered him, God would not accept him. Jephthah got right there. Jephthah made a foolish vow. 
if you deliver me, deliver the Ammonites into my hand, first thing that come out, I'm going to offer it to you. And what happened? It was his daughter. Now, biblical historians are not sure yet whether he really offered his daughter in sacrifice. Now, whether the fact that it talks about the virgins lamenting her, that he isolated her so she could never be married. Either way, it was a sacrifice and her life ended with her. But God did not demand that the daughter be offered up. And any time you start dealing with these foolish cults, and a lot of that stuff is going on in our nation, we have people offering up children. There is something demonic in the fact that every few days you read about children disappearing, children being killed. You've got people that are warped and demented, but I want you to know God does not require that you offer anybody's life up to him as an offering or as a sacrifice. You don't even have the power to offer your own life as anything but a living sacrifice. He says present your body a living sacrifice. Even when you get ready to kill yourself, you are out of the will of God. You don't have the power to kill your own self. So you sure don't have the sanction from God to kill anybody else. And a lot of folk have found out that even if they try to kill themselves, you can't kill yourself if God don't let you. You can inflict pain and cause yourself uh, to walk around or not even walk, but be handicapped for the rest of your life in attempting to take your own life. But when you get around, and this is a day when all kind of spiritual insanity is in the world and sweeping our nation. And while you are always talking about, I got to have more, you know, this, this, is, just, uh, this is just too, too common. I, I got to have something more. You better watch when you start reaching for that more. Because if you don't know what you're reaching for, you'll be like those young men that were gathering with the prophet Elisha. And somebody got a lap full of poison weeds and said, man of God, there's death in the pot. And you got a lot of folk now, they're gathering junk and they don't know what they're gathering. And it's driving them nuts and everybody around them. So you better be watchful with the religious teaching that you catch a hold to. Wanting more and you can get something that displeases God. Uh, I'm just I'm just talking to you all today. I don't know how long I'm gonna be before you. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wear you out uh, But uh, I got to get some things out of my heart God wanted him to have a Physical offering So he gets his son Puts on him the wood and here again. It represents Jesus Because the wood the cross on which he would die he had to carry his own wood to the place of the crucifixion. They get to the place and uh, the young boy, he is old enough to know what's happening. And he said, Father, uh, uh, here is the wood and here is the fire, but where is the lamb? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. God provides what we need in the physical. Uh, let me diverse one more time, digress one more time. I don't think you have a greater scriptural witness to the fact that God provides the needs of his people in the material greater than Elijah. Here is a man that when Israel being led by Ahab had gotten into bondage to a foreign and idol God serving Baal and Astaroth. And God reached over behind the mountain and brought out a man that nobody knew. He didn't even have a birth certificate. 
They didn't know who his mother was. They didn't know who his father was. It is only stated that he was Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead. And he steps in before Ahab and says, as I live, said God, there will not be dew nor rain falling on the ground, but according to my word, takes an invisible key and he locks up the heaven and it does not rain and the dew does not descend on the ground for three years and six months. But when he pronounced that there won't be any rain, there won't be any dew, he himself was still a man in the flesh. So if there's no rain for anybody else, there's no rain for you. If there's no dew for anybody else, there's no dew for you. But what does God do for his servant but tells him how he can be sustained through this great famine? Go down to the brook of Kirith and dwell there. Don't, don't go wandering through the wilderness, but I got a designated place for you. I wish you'd tell somebody where God guides. God provides. He sent him to a designated place. Go to the brook Kirith, dwell there. I have commanded the raven to feed thee there. Now, you know, we look for food to come from that uh, waiter or waitress down at the uh, restaurant that hopefully has a uh, category A in health. I don't know anything that's worse than you just get through stuffing yourself, go home and turn on the television and find out where you just ate. Came up with a 60. Nah. <laughs> we, we'd rather know that, that we're in a place that's really uh, a place that is sanitary. But God sometimes provides through methods that seemingly uh, are the worst ways or uh, the last way you would think that God would provide. Go to the brook here, dwell there. I have commanded the raven. A, a, a nasty bird and he's going to bring you bread and flesh now whether it was clutched in his tentacles or whether it was in his mouth that still is not the way you would prefer to be fed but when you starving and there's no food coming from anywhere else that's when you will say any way you bless me Lord I'll be satisfied <laughs> twice a day every morning every evening right on schedule here comes a raven with a sandwich in his mouth and he ate that sandwich twice a day could drink water out of the brook but it came to pass that the brook dried up now he had sense enough to know when the brook dried up, God must have another designated place. The raven might keep coming with the sandwich, but if I don't have any water, I'm still at the wrong place. You got some folk, my God, uh, they, they, they uh, trying to drink water from a mud hole. You can't do it. As a child of God, you've got to have a steady diet of food from God's word and when the place becomes so contaminated that all that's going on Sunday morning Sunday night midweek service Bible study is people are uh, cutting one another's throat and people are fussing about what is and what ain't <laughs> if you let me say it that way and the stream becomes too muddy to drink something in you or to tell you that it's time for you to move on. I, I've known people who stayed in a place uh, that nothing was going forth from the word of God, but they stayed because they promised somebody that's dead and gone. I promised grandma that I wasn't gonna never leave this church, but baby, when the brook dry up, you better know where you can get some water. When the brook dries up, you got to know where to march to for the next meal. It came to pass that the brook 
dried up. And then God said, I'm still going to provide for you. Go down to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon. And if you understand the psychology of that, here is another place that you wouldn't expect God to send him. When you back up the trouble Israel is having is because Ahab went down to Zidon and married the daughter of the king of Zidon, Ethbel's daughter named Jezebel, and brought her from Zidon into Israel. Now God said, I'm going to send you to Zidon in order to have something to eat. Go down to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and I'm not going to send you to a rich woman. I'm not going to send you to a couple that's got a lot to spare. But I'm going to send you to a widow woman. And she's going to sustain you. And when he gets there, the widow woman is picking up sticks, getting ready to cook the last she had saying, I'm going to cook this and my son and I are going to eat it and die. But what does the prophet say? But bring me some water. She has a little water left, so she goes and get the water. But while she's on her way to get the water, he said, uh, 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 one more thing. When you bring the water, bring me also a cake of bread. Mister, didn't you hear what I said? I told you I didn't have enough meal but just to cook one cake. And I'm going to eat that, and my son and I, and we're going to die. That's all right, but bring me the first cake. Lord have mercy. He would have been in trouble if he had said that to most of the people that's in here now. You'd have had some choice words for that preacher. But he guaranteed her that I want you to know, do it. And your meal shall not fail. When I was a youngster growing up, I used to hear people preaching on that, that God ran the meal barrel over. So I think when I first started preaching, before I actually got in there and studied it, I might have said that a few times. But he didn't promise that the meal barrel was going to run over. He just said it will not fail. And when I came to the realization of what he meant by it will not fail, that's when I preached the sermon living from the bottom of the barrel. So you got a lot of folk think you're not blessed unless you have a bank account that's running over more money than you need. And yeah, the Lord haven't blessed me like he blessed so-and-so. But let me tell you, they may have millions laid up, but they can't eat but one day at a time. They can't live but one day at a time. And as long as God is blessing you every day, hallelujah, when I get up, I've got something to eat. I've got something to put on. When the evening comes, I've got a place to sleep. And when I get up the next morning, I still got something to eat. God bless this prophet to the extent that he didn't run the widow's meal barrel over. But when she cooked that first cake, sit down, y'all. She brought it to him. And when she went back, that was enough for her to cook a cake for herself and her son. I believe she went to bed with an empty meal barrel. But when she got up in the morning, God had put enough in there for breakfast. I believe when she got through at breakfast, it was an empty meal barrel. But when she went back in the afternoon, that was enough for dinner. Listen, I want you to know that whenever you need it, I serve a God whose name is Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. Glory to God. Whatever it is you need, he will provide. You don't understand right now. Children are crying and already talking about what they want for Christmas and what they want you to do. And, and you up here already talking about, I know I can't do it. But let me tell you something. You cannot say on October the 20th what God is going to do by December the 3rd. You don't even know what he's going to do this time tomorrow. I serve a God that gives out 24-hour miracles. 24 hours! I've known him to turn things around. Has he ever done it for you? My God, you didn't see how you were going to make it, but 24 hours! And God turned things around. I wish you'd just tell three people, my God's name is Jehovah Jireh. 
He's the God who does provide. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. One thing, he made available something in the physical which Abraham needed. But he also made it possible to fulfill a spiritual imperative. First, I talked to you about the fact that an offering, whether it's a check, whether it's currency, it's a physical thing. But although it's a physical thing, it serves a spiritual purpose. Whenever God says, don't come before me empty, and you come before God complying with what he says in scripture, you are not only making a natural commitment, but you're also fulfilling a spiritual purpose. So God made it possible for Abraham to do something in the spiritual realm. And when you get into the spiritual realm, you enter the realm of things that are intangible. Physical things you can see. Physical things you can touch. But spiritual things are intangible. Uh, you don't see a spirit. I don't care if you were born with a veil over your face. You don't see spirit. I don't care if you are the seventh son of a seventh daughter, you don't see. <laughs> Most of the times when people really think they're seeing things, it's because they get older. And when you get older, they have some things I think, um, um, Dr. Sims, I don't know what it's, it's floaters that's in the eye. And, and sometimes people look and, and that little floater was in the way. <laughs> oh, I, I saw my dead sister. No, you didn't. You saw a floater. <laughs> Spiritual things are intangibles. But that is not to say spiritual things are not real. God is a spirit, but he's real. But in order that he could have a greater relationship between you and me, in Colossians, Paul says, in him, in Jesus, dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead body. So the Father is spirit, the Holy Ghost is spirit, but God had to come into our midst. So he empties his divinity into a bodily form. And you can't touch the Father. You can't touch the Holy Ghost. But you can touch Jesus. Because he's the only member of the Godhead that's got a body. Yeah. Spiritual things. God made it possible for Abraham to fulfill a spiritual imperative. Something that exists in the realm of the intangible. Some of you are in the midst of spiritual warfare. Oh yeah, you don't understand why it looks like that same spirit that you have to fight with at home. You get to the job and it's another person, but it's the same spirit. Or maybe you go to the classroom and you run into that same spirit. It may even be in your neighborhood, you keep running into that antagonistic spirit that accusatory spirit different people different names different locations but the same spirit and when you are in the midst of spiritual warfare it brings about temptation sometimes you are tempted to say I ought to give up the fight you are tempted to say I'm destined to lose no matter where I am. But Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 that even when you're in the midst of spiritual warfare, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. When the devil is testing and trying you, 
The one thing he wants to make you believe is that you're isolated. That nobody has ever gone through what I'm going through. I'm going through this and nobody. I look down the street. That couple don't go through what we go through. Sometimes they're just better hypocrites than you. They come out of the door smiling and you come out frowning. And you'd be surprised to know they got a smile on their face. And what they're going through is much worse than yours. No temptation has taken you but such as is common to man. Anything you go through, somebody else is going through the same thing. But God is faithful. Oh my God, people may not be faithful. Your own blood relatives may not be faithful. Your best friends may not be faithful. But God is faithful. And his faithfulness dictates that you will not be tempted above that which you are able. Tell somebody, if God lets it come on you, it's because he knows he's given you strength to take it. Hallelujah. Oh yeah, you up here talking about this is the last straw. That's all I can take and I can't take no more. If you were at the point where you couldn't take no more, God would block it and wouldn't let it come. But he only lets it happen because he realized that what he put in you is stronger than what the devil is throwing against you. I don't know how many times when I read that 54th chapter of Isaiah and get down, I believe it's around the 17th verse where we love to quote, no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. But you got to read those verses above that because that's only the bottom line. Before the no weapon, he says, behold, I've created the smith, the gunsmith that blows the coals in the fire. I've created the waster to destroy. In other words, God is saying, the reason I'm about to give you the bottom line is because I've already examined what's in the gun. I know what caliber it is. I know the weight and strength of the bullet. I know how distant, how much distance the bullets will cover. And, and because I already know what's in the gun, I know what's in the bullets. I know what's in the person that's using the gun. I know all of the opposition that's going to come against you. I am the one that created all of that. He said, then when I created you, I weighed against what I put in you, against what is in the weapon. And I'm determined that what's in the weapon is not as powerful as what's in you. And because of what I put in the weapon, which is minus what I put in you, no weapon that's formed against you will prosper. Tell somebody God knows what he put in you. And he knows what he put in the weapon. And the weapon isn't made out of the stuff you are. Hallelujah. No weapon. Oh, let me hurry up and get finished. That's right. This is communion day. God made it possible when he provided the lamb for Abraham to fulfill a spiritual commitment. But thirdly, when God provided the lamb, he reestablished Abraham's prophetic link to the future. Listen to how it starts. Abraham, take thine son, thine only son that's what you got to understand God said to Abram in the 12th chapter of Genesis I'm going to bless you I'm going to make you a blessing I'm going to make your name great I'm going to bless him that bless you I'm going to curse him that curse you in thee and in thy seed all families of earth will be blessed and yet when God said it to Abraham and he was 75 and Sarah was 65, 11 years later when he was 86, Sarah still hadn't conceived. So they attempt to help God out. She gives her husband Hagar and Hagar conceives and the son is named Ishmael. 
but because God has said that my promise will come through Isaac. He blessed Ishmael in a whole nother category. But as far as the covenant that he had made with Abraham and Sarah, it was like Ishmael didn't exist. So God said, no, the only son that, that uh, my promise through you can be brought about through is Isaac. And now that you've had to wait 25 years for Isaac, now take Isaac and kill him and make him an offering. Offer him up to me. Hallelujah. So if Isaac had been killed, and if God had not resurrected him, all of what God said about in thee and in thy seed, all families of earth will be blessed, it couldn't have happened. Later on when he told him to count the grains of sand and count the stars, and I'm going to make your seed just that big, just that innumerable, if Isaac had died, all of that would have been wiped out. So when God said, Abraham, Abraham, stay your hand. Don't kill the boy. There's a ram that I've provided. God made it possible for the prophetic utterance that he gave to Abraham to be fulfilled. Some of you all are saying, I don't see how. God's going to do what he said that he's going to do in my life. But I want you to know that if God said it, you may not know what road he's going to lead, but he's going to do just what he said. When he gave him back Isaac, he reestablished the covenant that he made with him. Oh, somebody saying, I know that the Lord said some things to me years ago and look like those things are not going to happen. I thought I was on my way. I was being blessed financially. I was being blessed in my health. I was being blessed to have influence in high places. And now look like for the last few years, all of that is dead. But I hear the Lord said, you forgot about my power to restore. I restored Isaac back home to his mother. He went to be offered, but he ended up right back at home in the normal sequence. And the Lord said, I want you to know that for years the locusts have been eaten away. And even the promises that I said I was going to accomplish in you. You don't have the physical health you used to have. You don't have the money that you used to have. Look like your mind doesn't even focus like it used to. But God said, I've got the power to restore. I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar, my great army. God said, I'm still going to do what I told you I was going to do. Don't worry about unfulfilled prophecy. It's unfulfilled only because I have not allowed the time to come. But I want you to know your time is coming. Don't be weary in well-doing. In due season, you're going to reap if you just don't faint. I wish you'd tell somebody due season is on the way. Your reaping time is on the way. Whatever God promised, he's going to do just what he said. There's not a demon in hell that can stop God from doing what he said. Even death itself can't stop God from doing what he said. How many times have I told you if you've still got unfull commitments from God, you can't die until God does what he says. I wish you'd tell three people, get ready for it. Get ready for it. God is going to do just what he said. He is your provider. He is your way maker. He is Jehovah Jireh. Hey, thank you. He can do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask or think. God will provide. If you're wrestling with a spiritual problem, fighting against dependency, fighting 
Like Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I want to do good, but I get overpowered by evil. And then the evil that I say I'm not going to do, I find that's exactly what I end up doing. But I want you to know when Jesus became a reality in his life, I hear Paul say, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. I want you to know that whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual or whether it's prophetic, whatever you need for God to fulfill his work in you, the Lord, he will provide. You up here talking about what I can't do. I don't know how to do this. I don't have the strength to do that and look like I'm just a stuck, stuck in the mud and can't go no farther. Quit worrying about yourself. You don't have the power to even make your dreams come true. I don't care how the positive thinkers tell you that you can do it. You can only do it when God is on your side. For Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. But I hear him say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. When I got Jesus on my side, I can run through troops. I can leap over walls. I can do that which is impossible. Not in my own strength, but by the power of God that strengthened me. He knows what I need just like he knew what Israel needed on their way to the promised land. But they got him in by the Red Sea. God provided a rod. Said, Moses, all you got to do is point the rod at the sea and the waters will divide into parts. I want you to know, I don't know what the battle is you're facing in your life, but when you get down to the river, if God provider I'm through I'm stopping right here but just tell three people he is a provider he is a provider he is everybody standing on your feet Hallelujah. Before I offer this general prayer, and I know that there are those of you that you worship God by the clock. You work a full eight hour day and beg for overtime, but you just can't give the Lord longer than two hours. So you who have to go, you're not pleasing God and you're certainly not pleasing your pastor. But uh, you just got to go. You just go on. But those of us who remain, we're going to see what God will do in the midst of his people. Somebody in here today that's trapped you're trapped on the other side of a Red Sea. 
not the Red Sea that Israel crossed over, but your sea is a sea of chemical dependence. You're trapped in sin, but I want you to know God has provided Jesus to be your way of escape. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, don't put it off another moment, but make your way to the nearest aisle and come here right now. Bless you, my brother. Stand there and face the front. Stand right there. Stand right there. Bless you, my sister. Come on, the Lord is speaking. All over this building, come here, come, 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 come. Lost in sin, but God has provided a way of escape for you. Thank you, Jesus. From wherever you are, come here right now. Don't worry about who's not moving. If you make an effort to get out of your road, the people there will gladly let you out. Ah, thank you. That's it, saints. Keep giving God the praise. Come on, keep giving him the praise. Glory, hallelujah. Bless you, Reverend Wardell Johnson. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Don't stop praising him. Yokes are breaking while you praise him. Jesus breaks. Yeah, every phantom. Mm. Jesus breaks. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, thank the Lord. Woo! I'm going to give you another two minutes. Bless you, my sister. Come on. There are 25 more of you. God's call to come here. Jesus Christ. I'm waiting on you. Heaven is waiting on you. Bless you, my brother. Come on. Hallelujah. Bless you, young man. Hallelujah. That's right, my brother. Come on. Hallelujah. Woo. Come on, my sister. I'm waiting on you. Heaven is waiting on you. That's right, young man. Come on. Rejoices whenever I see any soul coming to the Lord. But something special happens in me when I see our young men come. Satan has so many tricks. For our young men, when you read up on the history of Israel, 
when they left out of Egypt, Zihon, the king of the Amorites, tried to stop them and couldn't. Og, the king of Bashan, tried to stop them and couldn't. They got to the borders of Moab, and uh, the king of Moab hired Balaam to come and curse them. But God wouldn't let Balaam curse them. Every time he opened his mouth, he blessed them. But when you keep on reading, you get down about two chapters lower, and Israel still messed up while they were camped out at Moab. Because although Balaam couldn't curse them, evidently he gave the Moabites the secret. And the Bible said that they committed whoredom. They got involved in sexual sins. And Israel still got defeated. Not with a brute army, but with their own weaknesses. We've talked about the days prior to the civil rights movement and how we marched. And we got to the lunch counters and we can ride anywhere on the bus and all kind of things. Gains that we think we made from the civil rights movement. But after the civil rights movement was over, we looked up and we had lost our young men. They're able to go to the lunch counters and able to go anywhere. But all of a sudden we found out we had a generation and this is about the second generation of young men who don't want to be men they get married and they don't want to support their wife and children increasing in homosexuality and the harder you preach against it the more they switch the more they turn and Satan himself is rejoicing because we are a race almost becoming extinct because we got more young men in jail than we have in college. And when I see young men that's willing to step away from the game, willing to step away from the norm and say, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I don't know what it does to you, but something on the inside starts rejoicing inside of me. God can take these young men and make them as busy working for Jesus as Satan walks them in the streets and they can help turn this thing around. Young man, don't you let nobody fool you. Right now, you are doing the most productive thing that you could do in your life. Coming to Jesus, he gives you power to live a new and a victorious life. I'm going to step down and shake hands with all of you, and then you're going to go with Elder Eddie Amos, and he's going to instruct you. That's all of you, male and female. But let me say, if there's anybody else that want to give your life to Jesus, step to the nearest aisle and come here now. There's some more of you, and I know you're here. And while they are coming, you that's already saved, and you want to make this your church home, you come on down too. Hallelujah, you're already saved, but you want to make this your church home. Come quickly. You got just about 20 seconds. If I see you moving in this direction, I'll wait on you. Hallelujah. Coming to be saved or coming for membership in this church.